Okay, again, this is not a new topic. None of this has really been new topics. These have just been really a culmination of everything that we've talked about already. And we're just kind of looking at it in a different perspective. So with this reaction, uh, this is called the Machel reaction. So it is one of these specialized terms, again, that's given to a pretty important reaction based on one of the people who discovered it. So you can thank Machel for going through this mechanism and this reaction. Don't hold a grudge against me. It's Machel's fault, not mine. So the Machel reaction is going to concern this type of molecule that we've seen before in the past. And this is a carbonyl that's adjacent to a double bond. And, and very early on when we first introduced this type of molecule, we said that delocalization can take place, right? We see this double, single, double bond with some electrons up here at the oxygen. So we said that delocalization can go through this entire part of the molecule and we could see maybe some movement of these electrons. So that's one of the first things that we have to keep in mind. You know, this does have a tendency to move as far as the electrons are concerned without any help or without any aid at all. So the electrons are going to be moving throughout the entire molecule. Okay, well, we can incorporate another reagent into the mixture. And typically, what's done in the Machel reaction is that we include a compound that has two carbonyl bonds. And in the center, we have a carbon. And then over here could be traditionally anything that it wants to be, but what we have discovered with the Machel reaction is that esters and ketones work out the best. So I could have, let's say, an OCH3 group and an OCH3 group here. They could be different if they wanted, but again, we're looking at very simplistic things, right? So I'm just going to keep it symmetrical on both sides just to kind of limit the possibilities that we could get. So either one of these could work. So I'm just going to put a big O or here in between. So a diester could work, ester groups on both sides, or a diketone could work, and that's ketone groups on both sides. And we can take this molecule that could be conjugated, and we could react it with a diketone or a diester in the presence of a base, OH-. Okay, so let's think about what's going to happen for a minute. The OH group is going to look at little bitty hydrogens that can be disposed of. And we're going to have to look at hydrogens that can easily be disposed of. And currently, right now, there's two of them. If I look at this carbon... This has an alpha carbon, no, not really, not to the left, but it has an alpha carbon to the right, so it has an alpha carbon right here. And this carbonyl is also involved in the structure. It doesn't have an alpha carbon there, but it's got an alpha carbon as well to the left. And this is a shared alpha carbon. So the oxygens are going to kind of be pulling electrons, and this oxygen is going to kind of be pulling electrons, and this poor carbon is caught in the middle of all the drama. And it's going to be too much for carbon to take. And carbon's going to make the decision, okay, fine. You know, you want these electrons, well, you can have them, but I'm going to have to get rid of something before I can give them to you. And then you can fight over them as much as you want. Okay, well, in order to get rid of something, it's got to get rid of a hydrogen. A alpha carbon is getting rid of an alpha hydrogen. So we have to have a home for that alpha hydrogen to go to. And that home, this hydrogen, is going to go to the base and form H2O of water. So when this hydrogen leaves, it's no longer a CH2 now, but just simply a CH group. So when that hydrogen leaves, 
it leaves behind its electron pairs. Now look at what we've done. Not what we've done. Look at what the molecule's done. The molecule's now saying, oh good, look, we've got delocalization now. We can get delocalization throughout this entire piece of the molecule, all the way through. Look at what this diester has done. Because now we have freed up some electron pairs on that center carbon, and now we've basically included more of the molecule in the delocalized network. The molecule's extremely happy. It loves it. Well, the same thing can happen to the ketone down here below. We can introduce a base to pull one of these hydrogens off. And when that hydrogen goes away, we're left with a free pair of electrons. And this also has delocalization, right? This O and the double bond C can come down in here now and incorporate itself with that free pair. And then that can continue over into the ketone on the other side. So we form this bridge. We've completed this link between the two carbonyl bonds. So the molecule very easily loses an acidic proton for that reason. It is sandwiched between two carbonyls and that makes that proton more acidic than it traditionally would be. And we have thrown in a base to take that acid or to take that H plus out. Okay, when this happens, we look at the way that we've drawn the structure and now we see some negative right we see some negatives here and we see some negatives there there's some free bonds on the oxygens as well but those really aren't going to be that important to us because oxygen doesn't really want to do anything with those free pairs you know it already has two bonds two pairs it makes it happy you know there's no formal charge on it these things are stable the carbon though in the center that has free pairs that's a negative that traditionally would not be there so even though that it wants to get rid of the hydrogen, it kind of wants to help satisfy that bond as well. So it's kind of this issue of wanting a cake but wanting to eat it too. You can't have it both ways. Well, that's what carbon's trying to do here. Carbon has the hydrogen in the beginning. He gets rid of it. The base pulls it off, and now carbon's got this free pair, and it doesn't want the free pair either. So it wants to substitute that free pair for something else. It wants that free pair of electrons involved in a bond. Well, that's where this molecule comes into play. So this molecule has a carbon double bond carbon, single bond carbon, double bond O. It's delocalized as well. And we could see some rearrangement that happens here. I mean, if we really wanted to show the delocalized network, we could show that the electrons from here can move into there. These electrons can be pushed up if they want to be. And we can draw this CH2, CH double bond, C single bond, O with electrons here, CH3. This carbon lost a bond, so that makes that one positive. And these, this oxygen gained electrons from the double bond makes that negative. And now look at what we've done. Because that molecule's delocalized on itself, we now have a carbon that's positive, and we now have a oxygen that's negative. Okay. Well, let's make this molecule a little bit more complicated. Instead of a CH2, let's put a CH there and just add a CH3 onto this end. Okay, so we just made it longer. That's all that we've done. It's still a positive, but we've just made it longer. So now I've brought into the picture one of these reagents, and let's just use the ketone down here at the bottom. The ester would behave the same way, but we'll just use the one down here at the bottom. It's easier to get to. So this negative pair... Well, that negative pair now is going to be attracted to the positive carbon, and we're going to see a hookup point at that location. Now, this is not an alpha attack. This is my alpha carbon. This is a beta carbon. So what we've done is that we have started with this thing called a alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl right we've seen that term before alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl 
and this in particular is a ketone, alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. Delocalization is going to take place. We could see some electron movement that happens, and this frees up kind of a carbon that's partial positive or full positive here at the beta spot. So this is a beta attack. A little different than the alphas that we've always been focused on. And this molecule is going to go into the beta carbon and attack the beta carbon. And that molecule is going to attach itself to the beta carbon. So what we see as far as the product, just take your time. Be careful when you draw it. CH3, CH single bond C H double bond C single bond O and C H three the only thing that I've done is I've just recopied this from up above that's all that I've done I've just recopied and we now know that a site of attachment is going to happen right here right that's where my positive carbons at this is where my free pairs were so this is my C H involved at that spot and this CH has on it two carbonyl groups, a C double bond O and a C double bond O. Well, on one side of the carbonyl is a methyl group, so CH3 is there. And on this side of the carbonyl is another methyl group, so CH3 is there. We get this kind of structure that forms because of it, but that's not entirely happy. What we're actually going to see is that the oxygen is going to say, I don't think so. You gave me these electrons. I'm now fully negative. You're going to have to take them back. So oxygen takes these electrons and shoves them back into that carbon to reform the double bond. Carbon says, okay, fine. I'm going to have to get rid of the double bond, and I'm going to have to figure out what to do with this double bond. So what goes on with the double bond? Well, the double bond is going to break because we have now generated water in the mix, right? So we've started with a base. That base pulled a hydrogen off of this molecule in the very beginning, and this has went on to make water. Water is in our solution here. So the double bond is going to break and we see a single bond form instead. And what goes on to that carbon that was involved in the double bond? Well, that's a hydrogen from the water. So one of these hydrogens will be pulled off. It goes to that carbon to satisfy the octet. And we spit back out OH minus. And that, by definition, is a catalyst, right? We've regenerated our catalyst now. And the catalyst goes on, it takes the base, and it maybe attacks another molecule, and another one of these reactions begin to happen. So that is what we call the Machel reaction. So this is our ending product. Kind of nasty looking on a sheet of paper, right? I mean, this is a huge entire molecule that now we have basically spliced together. So talk about chain elongation. We really elongated a chain here. We have taken a carbonyl group and we have just added two more carbonyl groups on top of it. So now we've got a molecule that has three carbonyl groups. Talk about the reactions that we could do with a molecule like this. So this is the Machel reaction. This is all that we're going to talk about the Machel reaction, though. We're not going to go any further or any more in detail. Just understand that we can take a diketone or a diester, and we can add that onto an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl. And when we do that, we end up with a fairly large molecule that has multiple carbonyl bonds on it now.